Billy Epler is out here making moves on a Friday night. Two signings. First, Eduardo Escobar, then Mark Canna. The Mets have added two starting level players in the matter of a few hours. And we're going to talk about it all right now with Locked On Mets. <laughs> Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans who are listening to Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. Locked On Mets is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Now, we have a, a ton to talk about on this special edition of Locked On Mets. Uh, I am struggling to refresh Twitter and make sure I can keep you up to date with as much of the news as possible as things continue to trickle in. The Mets are being very active. So what we know right now is the Mets have added two starters to their lineup next year. Eduardo Escobar and Mark Canna. Now you can call them depth signings, but when you're paying north of $10 million for a player, the expectation is these guys will start. On today's show in the first segment, I just want to talk about what that means for the Mets when it comes to their starting lineup, how these guys will fit in. I already talked about Mark Canna last week, so we're not going to do the deepest of dives on Canna today, but I will talk in the second segment about Eduardo Escobar. Then in the final segment, I will dive into what this means for the Mets moving forward and also say goodbye to an old friend of this show, someone who is so great for content this season. That's Jonathan VR. I'm going to try to hold back the tears on that one, but we'll get to that in a bit. Before we do, I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing about the Mets at justbaseball.com. So what does this mean? The New York Mets just added two starters for less than $25 million on their payroll next season. That's what they did. Now, are these going to turn out to be the greatest of value signings? I don't know. I did see something right here. Ken Rosenthal tweeted out. This is going to be me working on the fly tonight. A lot of data coming at us. But Ken Rosenthal tweeted out that Mark Canna's value over the last four seasons uh, in 2018. This is according to Fangrass dollar metric. He was worth $16.7 million. 2019, he was worth $32.2 million. 2020 in the shortened season worth $13.9 million. And then in 2021, worth $20.7 million. This deal, two years, 26.5. That's a good value contract because he's a starting level player. He has been a positive for the athletics. 2019, as I talked about last week, probably a little bit of an aberration to have a four-war season when he has never really been that guy, and that was also the juice ball year. But he gets on base a ton, plays quality defense, a good athlete. That's a nice signing. He can replace Michael Conforto, although I would still like to see the Mets add a more star-level talent to replace Conforto, like a Seiya Suzuki. But if you do that, then Canna slides into left, and if your outfield on opening day is Seiya Suzuki, Brandon Nemo, and Mark Canna, you are in great shape. Then we talk about Eduardo Escobar. What does this mean for the Mets? Well, Escobar, he is, again, you could say depth, but because he's getting $10 million, because of the numbers he's put up over his last three full years, having wars over three in each of those last three seasons, not including 2020, obviously. This is a solid player. He's going to hit 20 home runs. He's a switch hitter. He's a good clubhouse presence. He is a nice fit to replace Jonathan VR, who we will cry about later. I'm uh, going to miss him. I-, I am. But the thing is, Jonathan VR carried the reputation of being a bad clubhouse guy. Now, we didn't see that with the Mets, but we don't really know what was happening behind the scenes. You are replacing VR's production with a guy in Escobar that's been a little bit more of a consistent hitter throughout his career. Defensively, I, I don't think that this is an upgrade for sure. I don't know if it's the biggest of downgrades. I was looking through his defensive numbers, and we'll dive into them more in the next segment, but he's not great, but he's not as bad as I thought he was. At the end of the day, he brings you that same versatility, though. He can play third. He can play second. He can't play short, 
where he can play first. I, I like that, that to bring that into your lineup. That's good. So that if somebody goes down, he's very flexible. Now, what this means as far as his role and where Eduardo Escobar is going to play, I would imagine he's going to be your starting third baseman. And what this also does when it comes to roster construction, now it makes J.D. Davis a little bit more open to be traded, although I think we all kind of assumed he was on the block. Jeff McNeil, maybe a little bit more wiggle room to trade him because you have a little more coverage in the infield. I'm not saying I would like the Mets to trade Jeff McNeil, but they might explore it if he is not a good clubhouse fit with Francisco Lindor and anything else that's going on there. Jeff McNeil, I believe, is still a player I'd like to see stick around. But when you add these two additions, that certainly is opening up some doors. And I think Jeff McNeil still has a lot of trade value, even off of a down year. So there is still something there, maybe, when you think about these two signings. But really, at the end of the day, when you're just looking at what the Mets did, they took an opportunity to jump on two players that can help them next year. And you figure it out later. That does not stop you from signing Javi Baez. That does not stop you from signing Starling Marte or Seiya Suzuki. That does not stop you from doing any of these other things that can still raise the ceiling of your team. But the floor just got raised significantly by adding two players who you could count on to get 500 plate appearances next year, be above average hitters in your lineup. And defensively, Mark Canna, I think, helps you. Eduardo Escobar doesn't necessarily help you, but he brings versatility to your club. And that's a good thing. And also, both of them have the reputation of being good clubhouse guys, which is something that's important as well. In the next segment, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the numbers on Eduardo Escobar. As I said, I talked about Mark Canna at length on the episode three under the radar signs the Mets could make this offseason. There you go. They signed him. You can go back, find a little bit more of an in-depth look at Mark Canna but he brings you, like I said before, a good on-base guy, quality defense, good athlete. We'll get to Escobar in just a minute. I love the holiday season with all the good food and treats, and dessert is always the best part of this time of year, but maybe you want to try a dessert that's just not so full of calories and sugar, which is why it is the perfect time for Built Bars. Built Bar is the new holiday dessert where you can feast on something delicious but feel good about it. One slice of pie is upwards of 300 calories, where a Built Bar is only 130 calories with only 4 grams of sugar, packed with plenty of protein. You can replace a coconut cream pie with a coconut Built Bar. Go for a raspberry Built Bar instead of that raspberry pie. They come low in calories, low in carbs, low in fat, but they are high in protein. They come covered in 100% chocolate. There's going to be new surprises all month with limited time flavors arriving at Built.com, so check the site often. Go to Built.com. Use the promo code LOCK15, and you'll get 15% off your next order. Again, that's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the numbers on Eduardo Escobar. If you go back to 2017, he had 21 home runs. 2018, 23 home runs. 2019, the juice ball year, he had 35 home runs. And then this past season, he had 28 home runs. A switch hitter with some pop. You look at his weighted runs created plus, which again is WRC plus, and it measures league hitters based on an average of 100. In 2018, his WRC plus was 117. In 2019, WRC plus was 108. And then this past season, it was 107. Nothing spectacular, but an above average hitter. And as I mentioned before, his F4 over his past three full seasons was over three each year. So a solid starting level player. The defense I thought was a little bit worse than the numbers tell us. I had always picked up on that perception that he was a bad defender, but if you go through the numbers, six defensive or minus six defensive runs saved at third base throughout his career. Uh, When it comes to outs above average this year, he was at minus three at third base, but he was at zero outs above average in 2020 and 2019. Not great defensively. I'm not going to, to make that leap, but he brings versatility. He doesn't have the most range, but because the Mets have gotten so much better with their shifting, because he's going to be playing next to Francisco Lindor, I think that can minimize some of his deficiencies defensively 
And overall, I think he can be at least close to replacement level defensively. Maybe he's a little below average, but he's not J.D. Davis out there. He's not double clutching every throw. He's going to be a little bit more solid than that. And offensively, he's going to bring that pop and he's going to bring a ton of experience. That is what the Mets got here with Canna and Escobar. They got a ton of experience. They got batters that can slot into your lineup. that are going to give you quality at bats. They're going to work pitchers. They're going to be able to pick up on things. And you go into the dugout after an at bat and maybe Escobar gets out on a, on a 10 pitch at bat and he strikes out, but then he comes in and he gives Francisco Lindor a little tip. And all of a sudden Lindor takes that tip and hits a home run his next at bat. There's a little things that having sage veteran players does for your ball club. And I think that's what the Mets are paying for here. Are these the two top targets that I wanted this off season? Not necessarily. I did identify Mark Canna as someone I would have liked to see the Mets sign. So I'm happy they got that deal done. Escobar was not entirely on my radar. I was swooning off of a season of Jonathan VR and all the fun we had with him this year. And I thought the Mets might just go that route. Maybe he would have been a little bit cheaper, but VR is a little more volatile. You know, VR is a player that can have a really bad season. (laughs) We saw in 2020, he was not good at all. And Everything that he might bring to you when it comes to base running, he's also taking away because for every run he scores with his heads up base running, and I should say heads up with some quotes around it, there's also five bonehead plays where he gets picked off. So you lose that, but what are you really losing or maybe what are you gaining? Escobar does not bring speed, but the power is there. Uh, and then the, the clubhouse leadership is also important. You've already seen Taiwan Walker praising the Mets for making this move. The two play together in Arizona said he's one of his favorite teammates ever. Francisco Lindor seems to be happy about the Escobar signing. You're just adding solid pieces here and there now to get your lineup to a point where it's at least decent right now. The Mets starting lineup is at least somewhat full, right? You can look at a team on paper right now and say, all right, it's starting to come together. You have Lindor at short, you have Alonzo at first, you had Nimmo in center, and then a catcher at James McCann. That's all we knew before today. Now you got Escobar at third, potentially at second, but I think we're all assuming he's going to be the third baseman, and Mark Canna in either left or right field. You can still add two more starters to this team and hopefully star-level players, whether that's Javi Baez, Seiya Suzuki, Starling Marte, anyone else you want to, to picture in a Mets uniform. but. Now the pressure is not as intense to sign a Javi Baez or complete bust because at least if you strike out on Baez and you have to go into this season with Jeff McNeil as your second baseman, Eduardo Escobar as your third baseman, with Lindor and Alonso, that's a quality infield. It is. It might not be the thing that Mets fans are thrilled about, but it's a quality infield and you still have the guys coming through the pipeline in Brett Beatty and Mark Vientos. So, so maybe that infield as presently constructed is not that bad. Again, I think there's still some turnover here. There's still moves that can be made. I think JD Davis is still likely traded. What is that going to mean for your ball club? What are you going to do with Dominic Smith? Does he stick around? Does he get moved? We really don't know. But again, these are just the first moves the Mets have made. And the one thing I don't want to see is Mets fans complaining about these moves because they weren't the huge big ticket options on the market. You need to shop in every single market. You can't just be shopping for the top tier guys and forget about these value signings that could fall by the wayside, go to other teams, and then you are thin. So the Mets make two moves here that make them better, and it's just the start. I think they have to do more, and that's what I'll talk about in a minute. What else should the Mets do now to accent this roster? And also, we had to say goodbye to a Mets legend. Broken up about this one. Really am. <laughs> Bet Online is back and better than ever, now featuring a new web interface for the start of the basketball season with more props, odds, and lines available than ever before. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. Head to their new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit just by using our promo code 
Locked On. From basketball to football, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, so I want to lead off this final segment doing a little thing I like to call reading Twitter <laughs> because we're getting some interesting Mark Canna stats right now, and I just want to share them with you all. Uh, this one, courtesy of Mets Metrics on Twitter, outfielders with 400 games played, a 360 on base percentage, and 20 stolen bases since 2018. Juan Soto, Bryce Harper, Mookie Betts, Christian Yelich, and Mark Canna. Uh, another one from Mets Metrics, notable position players with F wars since 2018. You got Carlos Correa at 11.4, Brandon Nimmo at 10.8, Mark Canna at 10.4, which is better than Nick Castellanos at 10.2, Michael Conforto at 9.7, Eduardo Escobar, another signing at 9.5, and Corey Seager at 9.2. Seager, of course, due to injuries rather than uh, a lack of talent for sure. He's a better player than pretty much all those guys we mentioned, except for maybe Correa. But regardless, Mark Canna is a really solid player. He's just been dealing in or living in complete obscurity out in Oakland, also in a terrible ballpark. Now he gets to go to a ballpark a little bit more hitter friendly. He gets to hopefully prove that he can play in a big market. And I think he's really going to be a solid addition to this Mets team. I like the Canna signing more than the Eduardo Escobar signing. I will say uh, Canna was a player that I've mentioned before that I think really brings a lot of value to this Mets team. So those two signings are set. What's next? The Mets are still very aggressive right now in the starting pitching market. Apparently, they have a lot of interest in Kevin Gosman. Gosman, like Stroman, pitched this last year on the qualifying offer, so you don't have to worry about losing a draft pick. They're said to have some interest in Max Scherzer and Robbie Ray as well, but with Max Scherzer, it's going to cost a ton of money when it comes to next season. Who knows? That could climb closer and closer and closer to $40 million, depending on how many years Scherzer signs for. If he signs a two-year deal, I don't think two years, $80 million is crazy. Honestly, if you could sign Max Scherzer tomorrow to a three-year, $120 million deal, I'd probably do it. But that's a podcast for another day. I also don't think Scherzer will be a Met. I've said that before. So when you look at the market, if Scherzer's out, Robbie Ray has the qualifying offer attached. The Mets would rather not give up that draft pick. And I personally would not like to see the Mets give up that draft pick for a pitcher in Robbie Ray that hasn't always been the consistent stud that he was this past year when he won the Cy Young. So that could lead Rhodes back to Kevin Gosman or Marcus Stroman, but Stroman is generating interest all over the place and may not want to come back to the Mets. We're still unclear where he wants to pitch, what he's looking for. He might be letting his market play out and the Mets might try to jump on Gosman if they can get him now. So if they can add Gosman, Stroman, any of those guys, a top tier starter, their offseason will have gone pretty well up to this point when you're just talking about roster construction. The bullpen, you still want to add some arms. You always want to add some arms. But they're going to be in pretty decent shape if they can add a top-tier starter, and then they can focus on depth to round out their pitching across the board. And then I still think this team is missing at least one high-ceiling star bat. And maybe that's Javi Baez. Right now, it seems like the market on Javi Baez is really heating up. Today, we saw reports about Javi Baez potentially signing with the Tigers. They have a lot of interest. We'll see if that is real or if maybe that's some posturing by Baez's camp to get maybe more years or more money out of the Mets. Uh, there are going to be a couple other teams in on him. The Cubs could always swoop back in and try to bring Javi back home. Who knows? But if the Mets ultimately sign Javi Baez, and, and there's still apparently a lot of interest, and that could be a sign that we see fall at any time, really. I mean, it seems like he is fielding offers and trying to get a deal done. If they were to land Javi Baez, on top of what they just did today, you can look at this team and see the picture of a quality group that would have come together. Because if you're infield, is Alonzo Baez, Lindor Escobar. Your outfield is Canna, Nemo, McNeil. And then you still have coming off your bench in some capacity, the likes of maybe Dominic Smith, Robinson Cano, 
DH bench role. Uh, you know, Louis Guillaume, defensive glow off the bench. They're starting to get a team that I like. Um, would you want to see them add another outfielder? Probably, but again, that is what is so good about the Mark Canna signing is if they go into this season with Jeff McNeil and left, Brandon Nemo and center, Mark Canna and right, they're okay. If they go into the season with Eduardo Escobar at third, Francisco Lindor at short, Jeff McNeil at second, and Pete Alonso at first, they're okay. So, so that is what these two signings have done. You are now one big move away when it comes to building out your lineup to having a pretty solid group that you're confident in going into next season. And then it's going to be about building out all that depth and all that other good stuff. But again, this was a great first step. You got a lot better. Your floor got raised a lot. We're still concerned about that ceiling, but Billy Epler has a lot of time. You still got what? We got November 26th, about a week. Next Thursday is when we're getting to uh, Doomsday Armageddon where the league will shut down. Could see a ton of stuff happen before that. All these guys just want to grab their money. That's how uncertain we are with this new CBA. Guys just want to have contracts, know they're going to be major league players under some form of a contract with an actual big league club. They do not want to be a free agent as the league shuts down. So we could see a ton happen over this next week. But for one day, the Mets did not screw up. They made two signings I like. We'll talk about it throughout next week. Unless some more news drops, we'll be back on Monday with Locked On Mets. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you follow me on Twitter. Oh, man. This is not even – I almost forgot. Okay. We're going to keep all that in. Because I have a prop here. I almost forgot to say goodbye. My guy, Jonathan VR. <sighs> Had to put this in. I, I I I brought the jersey out and everything for it. Jonathan VR. I bashed him when the Mets signed him. I, I said he was going to be terrible. I said, what were they doing? And he turned in a quality season. He was the best player on the Mets for stretches. Carried the lineups at times hit those home runs, electrified us on the base pass, was better than we thought defensively. It was honestly just a great season. Um, And now we move on. That's going to be today's episode of Locked On Mets. As I said before, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show, at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, check out the Locked On MLB Prospects show hosted by my guy, Arm Layton. It is the best place to go to learn about the stars of tomorrow. You can find Locked On MLB Prospects wherever you get podcasts.